Hi, everyone. We're just going to give uh, the audience about one or two more minutes to come in, and then we'll get started. Thank you. Are you using the Okay, welcome everyone. We're delighted that you've joined us for another session in our Upgrade Oncology Pathology Series, co-hosted by ASCP and Project Pink Blue. Uh, please remember to use the Q&A box to ask any questions of our speakers today, and we'll be sure to uh, include them at the conclusion of each part of the talk. Today's speakers will be Dr. Karen Fritchie, Dr. Hakan Ilislan, and Dr. Vicki Cho. Dr. Fritchie will start us off with a presentation on pathology radiologic correlation of giant cell rich bone tumors with musculoskeletal radiology input from Dr. Ilislam. Dr. Joe will then present on cytology of soft uh, tissue tumors, a pattern based approach. So, Dr. Fritchie, um, if you could please start with a very brief uh, introduction of you and same for uh, Dr. Ilislan, and then go ahead and get started on your talk. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. So uh, my name is Karen Fritchie. I am a bone and soft tissue pathologist from uh, Cleveland Clinic, and my practice is almost exclusively now bone and soft tissue pathology. And I'm here with Dr. Ilislan. Hi, this is Daniel Aslan. I'm a musculoskeletal radiologist with interest in uh, bone and soft tumors and uh, also image-guided treatments like ablations. Okay, so... Um... Okay, so um, in the next hour or so, what I want to kind of uh, talk about are bone lesions that have uh, uh, a lot of giant cells. And um, I think it's important to understand that almost any bone lesion, primary metastatic, benign, malignant, can have giant cells. So um, to kind of help us navigate this pattern, we're going to talk about uh, different patterns you can see with the giant cells and how they can be useful to getting to the right diagnosis. We'll talk about how uh, radiology and clinical correlation is actually essential. And we'll talk about some new immunostochemical and molecular techniques that can aid us in um, making a specific diagnosis. And along the way, we'll talk about the differential diagnosis of an epiphyseal lesion from a pathology standpoint. Um, so as I mentioned, giant cells in bone lesions are, are really ubiquitous. They're not specific at all. They can be seen in a lot of, of different tumors, both um, benign, malignant, um, even in metastatic disease. But the pattern of the giant cells can actually be helpful in uh, generating a differential diagnosis. So we'll kind of go over the different patterns you can see. Um, but at the end of the day, it's actually the mononuclear cells that are really key in determining whether we're dealing with a benign or malignant process. So it's really important to you know, make sure we're also taking those cells into consideration. So the three main patterns of giant cell distribution we're going to talk about today are seen here. Uh, the first on the left are, um, are very evenly spaced giant cells in the background of mononuclear cells. So this is the first pattern we're, we're going to talk about. Uh, the one in the middle is where we have kind of unevenly spaced giant cells in the background of, of kind of bland ovoid to um, slightly spindled mononuclear cells. And the third pattern on the on the right is a giant cell rich lesion that has a cystic morphology. 
And um, towards the end of the talk, we'll, we'll talk about a differential for this. Um, and along the way, we'll kind of uh, bring this concept up. And this is kind of a very basic um, differential diagnosis when you know we see an epiphyseal lesion. And this is something that I, I use pretty often in my practice. And you know, when we have an epiphyseal bone lesion, um, the next thing I, I kind of take into consideration is the patient's age. Um, if the patient's less than 18 years of age or, or skeletally immature, and I have an epiphyseal lesion, I think about chondroblastoma. And conversely, if the patient's greater than around 18 or uh, years of age or skeletally mature, my differential switches to giant cell tumor of bone and clear cell chondrosarcoma. So again, a really dif a basic differential, but this is this can be helpful. And then finally, what we're going to kind of get to in this talk is um, ancillary studies that can be helpful in bone tumors. And you know, if we looked at this list maybe 10 years ago, it would be very short. But in the past 10 years, we've actually learned a ton about um, the molecular and genetics of these of these bone tumors. So we'll we'll kind of get into that and look at how we can exploit this using specific stains like these new histone markers and um, things like next generation sequencing to make a more specific diagnosis. So we'll kind of talk about these things as we go through. Okay, so we're gonna, um, the rest of the talk is gonna be predominantly, predominantly case-based. We'll look at a, a few cases and then talk about some lesions. Um, the first case is a 40-year-old male with a distal femur lesion. And um, the lesion was curetted and we can see a low power view of the tumor in this field. We take a closer look and we see that we have abundant giant cells. So this is a giant cell rich tumor. Um, and I would say that, you know, when I look at this pattern, I see that the giant cells are very evenly spaced. Um, and if we take a closer look, we can see that the mononuclear cells in the background are also um, are very bland. Uh, they're uniform. They're kind of um, ovoid to uh, maybe slightly spindled. And the nuclei look very similar to the nuclei of the giant cells. Um, so when I see this pattern of evenly spaced giant cells, there's uh, three things I think about. Uh, the first is giant cell tumor of bone. Second is chondroblastoma. And the third is this recently described entity, which we don't have a, a great understanding of yet, but we're starting to see these in our practice. And these are these, are these so-called keratin-positive giant cell-rich tumors that have an HMGA2 and core uh, NCOA, NCOR2 fusion. So we're going to go through each of these entities one by one. So giant cell tumor of bone, uh, this is a locally aggressive and rarely metastasizing neoplasm. A small subset of these are, are malignant and they um, look malignant and they act in a malignant fashion. Uh, these typically arise in the ends of long bones in skeletally mature patients. Um, in the axial skeleton, they can occur in the sacrum and vertebral bodies. Uh, they can be complicated by a pathologic, pathologic fracture in a, a, about 10% of cases. And one of the things we've learned recently is that the majority of these giant cell tumors of bone harbor uh, mutations in the H3F3A gene, which codes encodes for a histone protein. Um, so I'll let Dr. Ellison talk about the radiology of these tumors. So <clears throat> when we look at the radiographic appearance and the CT um, of the uh, giant cell tumors, what we expect to see is uh, a lytic lesion with uh, narrow zone of transition. Um, O-line cortex is typically uh, either thinned uh, and or expanded. And the uh, destruction of the cortex uh, is pretty unusual. Uh, what's very typical and what helps us to uh, differentiate these uh, from a very similar appearing chondroblastoma is that these lesions tend not to have surrounding sclerosis uh, at the margins, um, uh, in addition to the age of the patient, because sometimes there could be some overlap for uh, giant cells and the chondroblastomas. Uh, pathologic fracture is uh, not uncommon, as Dr. Fitchi mentioned, that around 10%. And we also don't expect to see a matrix calcification or mineralization uh, 
unless they're treated with denosumab, which uh, makes the lesion look uh, entirely different uh, during the course of that treatment. When we look at the MRI features, uh, I know this is a little maybe uh, too technical uh, for an audience of pathologists. Uh, we do use different uh, pulse sequences to look at the uh, qualities of the uh, tumor. Uh, the main ones that we use are T1-weighted images where we have the bone marrow uh, bright because of the uh, fatty content similar to the subcutaneous tissues. And what we expect to see is intermediate signal. We usually uh, use skeletal muscle for comparison and it's slightly hyper intense uh, and intermediate signal on T1 weighted images. We can see some heterogeneity, uh, particularly with the T2 weighted and uh, STIR sequences. And these sequ sequences tend to be very sensitive to presence of fluid or hemorrhage. And you can see the joint fluid being very bright. And within the lesion, there are areas that are also bright, uh, similar to fluid. These indicate uh, areas of hemorrhage. And this is a post-contrast image. It essentially gives us an idea about the vascular nature of the lesion. And you can see that uh, hemorrhagic focus is not enhancing. So it's uh, very typical uh, findings of uh, MRI, and if ABC-like uh, areas are present, of course, we would expect to see fluid-fluid uh, levels, but this is a coronal plane as if you're looking straight into the knee. This is not where we would expect to see those fluid levels. Uh, because it's a dependent finding, we would expect to find those on axial plane. Uh, so this is a very nice gross image of a giant cell tumor of bone. And you can see that the cortex looks like it's kind of uh, thinned and maybe uh, focally destroyed. Um, and you can see that the tumor is kind of this friable uh, red, brown, tan color. And there's uh, multiple cystic spaces that are filled with blood. And uh, this is the histology. These tumors um, have a really characteristic uh, pattern of evenly spaced giant cells. And then the background mononuclear cells are uh, kind of ovoid to epithelioid. Sometimes they can be spindled, but importantly, there's no cytologic atypia in the mononuclear component. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, these tumors have uh, mutations in H3F3A, um, and we can um, use that with the G34 um, I mean, it's a chemical stain, which stains the um, nuclei of the um, mononuclear cells. And we don't always need this immunostain, but it really can be a helpful marker in, especially in cases where, um, you know, we're only getting a small biopsy or perhaps the radiologic findings are a little bit unusual. Okay, so the next tumor in this differential of kind of evenly spaced giant cells is chondroblastoma. Uh, this is another tumor that um, occurs in the epiphysis, epiphysis or an apophyseal equivalent. It's a pretty rare bone tumor. It's uh, less than 1% of all the tum bone tumors that we see. And as we kind of mentioned already, these usually occur in patients that are skeletally immature. Um, in exceptional cases, patients can develop lung metastasis, but uh, this is very, very um, unusual. So <clears throat> when we look at the imaging features of chondroblastoma, starting with radiographs, um, very similar in many ways to uh, giant cell tumors. They're well-defined lytic lesions, but as opposed to giant cells, as shown in this image here, that there's a lytic lesion, yes, but the margins are sclerotic. So it's a well-defined and sclerotic margins. It's typical. And, and this is in a flat bone and it's the epiphyseal equivalent, which the apophysis and the posterior calcaneus. And this is a borderline age. Uh, 
obviously at this age, we might see some giant cell tumors as well. Uh, and the growth plates uh, are starting to close at that point. As they enlarge, in some cases, they can uh, involve the um, metaphysis also uh, in the long bones, essentially. And the cortical breach is very rare as opposed to giant cells where we can see some cortical breach in some cases. Internal calcifications uh, or the mineralization can be seen in a decent number of cases, like about half the cases uh, can show. And here it's difficult to appreciate because of the overlying bone, but I suspect there is little mineralization inside the solidic lesion, particularly in this area more anteriorly. And their range, uh, they could be very small or they could be as large as 10 centimeter, but the majority are gonna be around three to four centimeter in uh, diameter at the time of the diagnosis. Looking at the MRI, um, obviously MRI is ideal for showing the extension of the tumor. And also it's great to show the surrounding bone marrow and soft tissue edema because when we look at, a, uh, look at an x-ray, uh, we do see the lytic lesion, but we cannot really uh, comment any further. MRI allows us to uh, you know, look at the adjacent uh, soft tissues as well as the bone marrow. And uh, these lesions are very much marrow, uh, uh, marrow edema producing lesions similar to giant cells, but we also see uh, things like osteoblastoma uh, and uh, osteoblastoma and also uh, Langenhans cells, histiocytosis. So these are the main lesions that I would think of when I see this much edema on this T2-weighted image again, you know, accentuating the effects of the fluid signal and showing that uh, marked bone marrow edema. Uh, we can uh, have some heterogeneous enhancement if we have uh, contrast um, and fluid fluid levels can be seen uh, in these cases, similar to uh, giant cell tumors. I think we were more focused on calling these uh, secondary uh, aneurysmal bone cysts, but uh, I believe more recent uh, work showed that all of these uh, secondary ABC-like areas would also contain uh, chondroblastoma or giant cells uh, in those areas. Okay, so here is the histology of a chondroblastoma. And again, you can kind of see again, um, the background giant cells are, are pretty evenly spaced. And in the intervening stroma, we're seeing um, monotonous uh, ovoid cells. It's kind of hard to appreciate on this image, uh, but these cells have these kind of characteristic nuclear grooves that you can see. Um, again, it's just kind of hard to appreciate on um, a static image. Um, not infrequently, these tumors will have uh, this kind of lace-like uh, uh, calcification, and they have this kind of pink to pale blue um, chondroid matrix admixed as well. Um, in terms of immunistic chemistry, um, these tumors have uh, also have histone mutations, and uh, these tumors stain for the K36M uh, immunostain. Again, we don't always need this for the diagnosis, but it can be a helpful supportive finding um, in challenging cases. Uh, the third tumor we're going to talk about in this differential is uh, a new an, a new entity, a recently recognized entity. Um, which has been kind of tentative, tentatively named uh, keratin-positive giant cell rich tumor with HMGA2 and CORE2 fusion. Um, I've seen a few of these in my, in my practice, and uh, the morphology is very similar to giant cell tumor of bone. They have very evenly spaced giant cells in a background of mononuclear cells. The only difference is that the mononuclear cells will show keratin staining. There's a few reports in the literature about this entity. They can occur both in soft tissue and in bone. It seems like in bone, they 
have a predilection for uh, places like the um, vertebral bodies. Uh, but again, our experience is limited. And to date, they seem to behave in a benign fashion. But again, um, it's I think we really have to do some more work um, with these tumors. And my suspicion is that, you know, we've called a lot of these giant cell tumors of bone in the past because the morphology is, is, is so similar. Um, so I've been doing keratins on, on my giant cell rich tumors. And again, that's how I've been recognizing this entity. Okay, so now we're going to kind of go back to our case. It was a 40-year-old male with a distal femur lesion. The morphologic pattern was that of a evenly spaced giant cell rich tumor. Um, radiology showed an epiphyseal lesion. So again, if I um, go back to my basic differential of an epiphyseal lesion um, in a skeletally mature patient, I would think about giant cell tumor bone or clear cell chondrosarcoma. And the morphology in this case is, is very compatible with giant cell tumor of bone. Um, uh, yeah, so you kind of follow this al algorithm. And uh, because the differential also includes this new entity with the HMGA fusion, I did a keratin stain, which was negative. And in this case, the G34W immunostain was positive. You can see good nuclear staining in the mononuclear cells. Um, so that helps us confirm the diagnosis of giant cell tumor of bone. Again, if you don't have a lot of this immunostain, I don't think you need it in this case, um, but it's helpful to, to, to use it to uh, confirm the diagnosis again in, in challenging cases. So the next case is a 10 year old with a distal tibial lesion and uh, the tumor was curetted and you can see several fragments of the tumor in this low power image. If we take a closer look, um, here we can see giant cell, uh, giant cells again, but unlike the prior case, uh, in this lesion, they look unevenly distributed. They're kind of haphazardly distributed in, in the background of um, kind of spindled mononuclear cells. Um, if we look at the, the cytology of the mononuclear cells, even though these are kind of more spindled in the previous case, they still appear bland. There's no hyperchromasia, there's no cytologic atypia. So here we have a, a giant cell rich tumor where the giant cells are unevenly spaced and they're in the background of these kind of, again, bland spindled mononuclear cells. So when I see an unevenly spaced giant cells, my differential is, um, is a little bit broader than the, or longer than the last uh, differential. It includes things like uh, solid aneurysmal bone cyst, um, central giant cell granuloma, brown tumor of hyperparathyroidism, uh, cherubism and non ossifying fibroma. So, we're going to kind of go through these entities one by one. Um, the first is a aneurysmal bone cyst or ABC. Uh, this is a benign neoplasm uh, which contains these uh, blood filled cystic spaces. Uh, these can affect really any bone, but they usually arise in the metaphyses of long bones. Um, also, they can affect a, a very broad age range, but they're most common in the, the first two decades of life. And the most con common cl clinical symptoms would be pain and swelling. So in terms of radiology, I'll let Dr. Lozon talk about that. Yes, the um, ABC, uh, starting with the plain film uh, or radiographs and uh, CT, we expect to see a lytic lesion with uh, pretty sharply defined uh, margins, uh, tend to be uh, very thin and expanded, hence the name uh, aneurysmal. It's like a blown up area. So when there is a very mild area of uh, cortical remodeling and expansion, that would not necessarily correlate with what we expect to see with these ABC cases. Here's an example where we see um, a, a lesion uh, extending from the glenohumeral joint uh, down, and you can see that there is a, a very thin cortex, and this is like blown up uh, aneurysmally. Uh, so if this was a small area sticking out, I wouldn't have uh, thought about uh, ABC in this particular case. CT uh, can show us uh, the cortical integrity better and uh, because it's at times very thin and expanded. And it can also show fluid fluid levels, although uh, 
they're much harder to see on CT compared to MRI. So the MRI uh, would show fluid fluid levels. Uh, when we see some solid uh, component, uh, then we start thinking about uh, an underlying lesion, perhaps uh, chondroblastoma, giant cell, which are pretty common to have ABC-like areas. But we should also keep in mind that there are some solid ABCs with more cystic and solid components. Um, so those will also uh, confuse us, thinking that there's another lesion, even though it's a primarily ABC type lesion. Uh, these cysts uh, will show variable signal, uh, particularly uh, on T2-weighted images. And we can also see uh, these uh, heterogeneous areas on uh, T1-weighted images because uh, at times the uh, hemorrhage can have bright uh, areas simulating the uh, subcutaneous fat, but these areas will never show the fat suppression. Here's a nice example, uh, the area that almost looked like the subcutaneous or marrow fat, but when we look at the fat suppressed uh, images, uh, it's still very bright, uh, reminding us that this is not fat, this is more uh, recent hemorrhage, maybe subacute. And these are the fluid levels that I was referring to. The patient is lying on the back, so it goes to the dependent part, and the axial shows these uh, multiple fluid levels. And one thing that comes to mind, of course, a more aggressive lesion like uh, telangiectatic osteosarcoma, but those tend to be uh, more numerous, uh, like essentially... Uh, uh, innumerable that very small cystic spaces and the radiographs tend to be more aggressive and more destructive looking um, and in some cases it's hard to tell so we might uh, end up biopsying those and even uh, it's a giant cell or ABC they would always have to be uh, biopsied uh, to confirm the uh, diagnosis suspected on the imaging and when there are solid components, as I mentioned, if there is contrast on board, they will enhance and uh, surrounding marrow edema-like areas will also enhance because uh, they are showing hyperemia, which is a pretty nice specific finding. Okay, so um, in terms of the histology for ABC, uh, the classic variant um, is going to show these uh, cystic spaces, um, where the solid variant is more, um, you know, uh, lacks the cystic areas. Uh, but in the walls of the cyst and in the solid areas, you're going to see um, the same pattern, which is unevenly spaced giant cells in a background of bland uh, spindle cells, which are fibroblasts. Um, these can have um, kind of seams of osteoid deposition and woven bone. And it's important to recognize you can see mitotic figures. Mitotic figures don't bother me unless they're atypical. So you shouldn't see any atypical uh, mitotic figures in aneurysmal bone cyst. If you started to see atypia and atypical mitotic figures, you would start to see or start to think about um, a telangiectatic osteosarcoma, as, as Dr. Illusan mentioned. Um, about 70% of aneurysmal bone cysts, both solid and conventional, will have uh, USP6 rearrangements that you can detect by fish studies. Again, this is not always necessary, but if you had a, a small biopsy and the differential included um, telangiectatic osteosarcoma, in that scenario, doing fish to confirm or uh, to show or not show a USP6 rearrangement might be helpful in differentiating those two entities. So um, in rare cases, fish uh, can be helpful as a supportive finding. Um, in terms of treatment, um, these can either be curataged or resected. And um, in terms of the treatment, I don't know, Dr. Lassan, you know more about this than I do. We, uh, a traditional treatment uh, was surgical curatage and resection uh, with or without augmentation. But in the recent years, uh, doxycycline uh, injection became uh, popular uh, 
uh, with or without denosumab, particularly in the areas where it's difficult to operate. Um, uh, one of our examples shown here, where we have a large uh, lytic lesion in the posterior stabulum, which is interfering with the stability of the hip joint. And, and this, these are young patients and they have a long life ahead of them. So considering a major surgical resection would result in hardware fixation. And as you well know, uh, there are many complications that can happening uh, that can be happening uh, after the surgery. Uh, that's why what we do is uh, find an area uh, as indicated there under CT guidance on the image below and uh, inject, uh, drill through the bone, inject in this area. We typically inject some uh, contrast to make sure that there are no large draining vessels, because one of the concerns is when we inject doxycycline, which is uh, mixed with uh, some air and um, an albumin to make into a foam that could embolize the lungs if it's like if there's a straight shot going in there. So after doing those, uh, these patients respond pretty well and they come back with uh, healing in almost all the cases. And uh, we have to go after all the small pockets. Uh, the con contrast will also give us the idea of how much of an area we're reaching. And if needed, it can be repeated. And when it's combined with denosumab, it can uh, make the healing process much faster. And this is our uh, kit that we use. This is me. Uh, mixing the uh, you know, uh, albumin and doxycycline and going back and forth, creating that foam. At the end, uh, it turns into this white foamy uh, substance, and then we inject under CT guidance into that uh, cavity. Here's an example how this could work. Another uh, patient who has this very large lytic, uh, scary looking lesion. And as you can see, uh, we, we did the biopsy and it turned out to be an ABC. And during the procedure, after we inject the contrast, you can see the areas of contrast uh, that are much brighter, uh, like fluid levels. And uh, after injecting uh, the mixture of albumin and doxycycline and air. Uh, in the follow-up CT, there's a dramatic response and you can actually see more, more bone forming and uh, turning into a um, almost something like an osteoblastoma or something, but we know that this is the normal healing response following the treatment. I believe this patient also received denosumab because the fear was that uh, if this lesion progressed, it was going to cause instability, which would be a main issue for a lesion that's around the mid, uh, mid to high cervical uh, level, uh, which would be a disaster for a 24-year-old uh, patient, as indicated here. Okay, so after solid ABC and ABC, uh, one of the other um, entities that can have un unevenly spaced uh, giant cells in a background of mononuclear cells is this entity called a central giant cell granuloma. Uh, this is benign, but can be aggressive in some situations. Um, and it usually occurs in the mandible, less commonly the maxilla, and patients present with pain and swelling. Um, and these, as I mentioned again, are benign. They typically don't recur after curatage. Um, and recently we've discovered, like for a while, I think it was under debate whether these were um, true neoplasms or not, but recent work has shown that these have uh, KRAS and FGFR1, um, as well as TRPV4 mutations, all um, that affect the MAP kinase pathway. Um, and, and these characterize these giant cell, um, central giant cell granuloma, supporting that these are actually true neoplasms. Um, this is uh, for the radiology for these tumors. So when we look on the uh, CT and plain films, the imaging features are usually um, uh, 
uh, non-specific, and we always have very much difficulty uh, interpreting these uh, uh, mandible and the uh, maxillary lesions. Um, they typically start as a small lytic lesion, and uh, when they enlarge, uh, the uh, there is um, the thin trabeculation of the bone becomes more apparent, giving this uh, typical honeycomb or multilocular appearance. I think uh, as demonstrated here, there's a lesion on the um, uh, left side here. Uh, it's like myelosclerotic and uh, there's some multilocular uh, appearance. And as they uh, grow, they can uh, demonstrate further expansion. And you can see how the cortex is expanded. That's something we try to see and understand because that's a sign of a lesion that's growing slowly as opposed to destroying the cortex. And it's both anteriorly and posteriorly, the cortices are expanded. Okay, in terms of morphology, as you can appreciate, the morphology of this looks very similar to a solid ABC. Um, you can see that uh, here it's it's low power view shows it's it's kind of um, uh, kind of a large expansile multi lobular lesion, and on higher power you can see the same pattern we've been talking about with these unevenly spaced. Um, giant cells in a background of bland mononuclear cells. So again, in cases like this, radiology and, and knowing where you are is, is really important in, in getting to the right diagnosis because the morphology is, is actually pretty nonspecific. Um, the next entity is brown tumor of hyperparathyroidism. Um, most patients are actually asymptomatic, but they might present with joint pain in a minority of cases. Um, clinically, they can have uh, things like secondary hyperparathyroidism, um, or patients with secondary hyperparathyroidism can have renal failure. So looking at the their lab values can actually be helpful if you're thinking about this diagnosis. Um, the morphology you can see on the right, again, is very similar to the to solid ADC and uh, central giant cell uh, granuloma, where we have unevenly spaced giant cells and the background mononuclear cells are are kind of ovoid to spindled. And as I mentioned before, there, you shouldn't see any cytologic atypia. Um, interestingly, in the past few years, we've also recognized that uh, brown tumor are actually true neoplasms. They're driven by KRAS mutations. So um, it kind of links this tumor to the other uh, tumors in this differential um, with alterations in the MAP kinase pathway. Um, next is cherubism. And this is a really rare um, entity, we really don't normally see um, pathology specimens on this. Uh, these are uh, rare autosomal dominant. Um, uh, this is a rare autosomal, domi autosomal dominant disorder uh, where you see um, symmetrical expansion of the maxilla and mandible uh, by this giant cell rich lesion. Most cases are going to show mutations in the SH3 uh, BP2 gene. And Fortunately, most patients uh, regress after puberty, but um, some can showed, uh, show continued growth. And um, you can see on the far right, the morphology, which again is very similar to the things we've been talking about where we see unevenly spaced giant cells in the background of mononuclear cells. Again, just reiterating that um, with this pattern correlation with clinical findings, radiology, even um, lab values, if you're thinking about brown, brown tumor is really important. Um, Dr. Lassan, I don't know if you want to care comment on the sure. radiology. You know, this. these uh, typically have very unique uh, features. As you can see, uh, there's bilateral expansion of the uh, 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 mandible and with areas uh, of cortical discontinuity. And this correlates pretty well with the clinical picture where we see the expansion of the jaw and uh, we don't really see any mineralization uh, underlying this uh, considering the extension, uh, ex you know, like bilateral involvement, uh, we can uh, confidently say that this would be typical of cherubism in this patients. Okay, and that brings us to the last entity in this differential, and this is non-ossifying fibroma. Uh, this is a benign and self-limited um, 
proliferation of giant cells in the background of spindled cells. Uh, the vast majority arise in the metathesis of long bones in the lower extremity. Uh, these typically occur in young patients that are skeletally immature with a uh, peak incidence in the second decade of life. And these are typically asymptomatic <clears throat> and discovered incidentally uh, unless they have a pathologic fracture. And <clears throat> again, recent uh, work has shown that these tumors also have mutations in the MAP kinase pathway um, in KRA. So again, 10 years ago, we didn't really know the, anything about the genetics of these giant cell rich tumors. And now we're really um, figuring out a lot about what drives them. And it seems like a lot of these are linked by uh, mutations in, again, the, the MAP kinase pathway. Um, so looking at the radiology of uh, nanosphine fibroma on plain film and CT, what we expect to see is uh, multi-loculated lytic lesions with sclerotic uh, rim, and they're typically located eccentrically in the metaphyseal area adjacent to the growth plate. As patients get older, they can uh, migrate away from the growth plate, but they maintain the typical location uh, of uh, eccentric um, in the long bones uh, with uh, sclerotic margins. They can uh, occasionally have uh, associated pathologic fractures, which could uh, increase the anxiety of the referring clinicians and uh, the parents. Uh, unless there's a fracture, we don't expect to see any uh, periostitis or cortical breach in such uh, patients. Here's a typical example on the distal fibula. You can see that it's a medial lesion, it's lytic, and uh, cortex is intact, and we have sclerotic margins, and we do not have any associated fracture, at least in this case, it was a 13-year-old female patient. Looking at the MRI, uh, appearances are uh, variable and depends on when we catch them at what phase of their development and healing. Initially, the lesions have a uh, more bright, uh, meaning that higher inter or intermediate signal on T1-weighted uh, or STIR sequences that are uh, fluid sensitive, as I mentioned before. As the lesion uh, uh, matures, uh, it begins to ossify the signal becomes, uh, the MRI signal becomes uh, low or darker on all pulse sequences. And contrast enhancement is variable. And here's a lesion on the, at the bottom, it's a 15 year old. And in the post contrast, you can see there is uh, areas of enhancement and the darker areas more centrally, these are already ossified and healed. So uh, they're not going to be expected to uh, enhance. And this is uh, a T2-weighted fat-saturated images, uh, image showing, again, the lobulated contours and these darker areas are already healing in this particular patient. Okay, so the histology for non-ossifying fibroma is what you see here. Again, unevenly spaced giant cells and the background cells are kind of ovoid to spindled, again, no cytologic atypia, and they're kind of arranged in this uh, a story form pattern, which I find is somewhat unique to non-ossifying fibroma. Um, again, it's always important to look at the mononuclear cells. Here they look very bland, uh, no real hyperchromasia or uh, cytologic atypia. Again, you can see mitotic figures. That doesn't bother me as long as I don't see atypical mitoses. Um, and as, as I mentioned, this seems to be the one tumor in this differential, which really has a, a distinct story form pattern. Um, so that can be a helpful feature uh, that you're, you're dealing with non-ossifying fibroma that would favor NOF over other things in the differential. Um, non-ossifying fibroma also typically has areas of foamy macrophages and hemocytoid macrophages as well. Um, which also could be soft clues that you're, you're dealing with an NOF rather than other um, entities in this uh, morphologic differential. So now we go back to our case. Again, we had a 10-year-old with a distal tibial mass, and our pattern was, um, again, a giant cell-rich bone tumor with unevenly spaced uh, giant cells. And um, the differential, I would 
generate is what we just talked about. Uh, we can eliminate um, these two entities because of the location. We're not in head and neck. Um, also, brown tumor would be very unlikely because this patient's young. I wouldn't expect um, him or her to have um, any um, things like renal failure or hyperparathyroidism. So really, you're left with a solid ABC and NOF. And in these situations, I, I, I bring the radiology and, and discuss it with Dr. Illislan. And um, uh, in this case, I also saw areas where there was foamy hip macrophages and, and a very story form pattern. So that was leading me to favor NOF. But again, um, I always shared these uh, cases with um, Dr. Illislan. And, and I don't know if in this case, would there be anything that would lead you to favor NOF over solid ABC or... Um, this, I would definitely, uh, think that this is a non-aspine fibroma because lesion is eccentrically located in the bone and, uh, it has sclerotic margins, which is quite typical of NOF as opposed to, uh, ABC, which tends to have very, um, uh, thin and, uh, not necessarily sclerotic margins. Um, and the, also, we, and when we look at the MRI, uh, there is um, quite a bit of uh, dark signal on the uh, T2-weighted image on the right side. This is coronal, as if we're looking straight, similar to the uh, plain films. So looking at these findings, I would think that this is quite typical of NOF. Okay, great. So putting all that together, um, we can make the diagnosis. So again, this just kind of illustrates how you know, morphology kind of drives the differential, but input about clinical findings and, and radiology is really um, essential in making the diagnosis. So now we're going to uh, move to the, the third um, case, and we're kind of running out of time, so um, hopefully we'll be able to, to finish in the next few minutes. But this is a 21-year-old with a proximal humeral mass, and you can see at this power, it looks cystic. So we have these uh, blood-filled cystic spaces, and in the wall of the cyst, we have bland spindled cells um, for the most part. <clears throat> and then we have areas of, of unevenly spaced giant cells, again, bland spindled cells. And there's some a hint of um, this immature uh, woven bone or kind of seams of osteoid in the background. So when I see this, I think of um, you know, it's my cystic lesion differential. And most of these cases are going to be either aneurysmal bone cyst or um, as Dr. Illislan mentioned at the beginning, a secondary cystic change in another primary bone tumor. Um, so other entities that we've talked about can have secondary cystic change. We used to call this secondary ABC, but since the lesional cells in these cystic areas have the same genetics of the un underlying tumor, uh, we now just call this secondary cystic change. So this is an example of an NOF with secondary cystic change. Um, Giant cell tumor of bone can do the same thing. Uh, here we have these cystic fit spaces. But interesting, the, interestingly, the lesional cells in these cystic areas stain for the G34W immunostain, supporting that these areas that look like ABC are just giant cell tumor of bone that um, have cystic degeneration. And um, chondroblastoma can do the same thing. This is an example of a chondroblastoma where we have um, these areas of kind of, kind of pink cartilaginous material um, and mononuclear cells with groove nuclei. And here we can see that this lesion is also um, forming these ABC-like areas. So back to our case, we have a 21-year-old with a proximal humerus mass. Uh, we have a cystic lesion with uh, giant cells. Um, and uh, within the um, fiber septa, we're seeing bland spindle cells <clears throat> with osteoid. And um, I don't know if you can say anything about this. It's not too much to look at, but would you, what would your differential be for this? So my differential for this, obviously ABC is one because it's uh, really expanded and uh, very thin sclerotic, um, uh, thin like uh, cortices. Uh, but it could also be uh, myositis ossificans at an early stage um, and because they tend to start ossifying at the uh, periphery and, uh, and sometimes joint bodies uh, fill the distension uh, and distended the uh, 
the joint capsule that could uh, throw us off. Um, synovial chondromatosis, uh, going down the list, uh, that can uh, be in the joint and can appear as subtly mineralized uh, areas. Okay, so the morphology in this case was pretty good for aneurysmal bone cyst. And since there was really no concern for an underlying primary lesion indicating that this could be a secondary secondary cystic change, um, we also did a G34W immunohistochemistry uh, uh, IHC marker and it was negative. So in that case, um, we felt that this lesion fit for uh, primary aneurysmal bone cysts. So the last um, differential we're going to talk about quickly is um, this pattern. This is an 80-year-old with a thoracic spine mass, and we got a core biopsy. And even at this powder, pa uh, power, you can see that there's giant cells in the background. Um, <clears throat> so again, we see giant cells in this lesion. But unlike the other cases we've seen, the mononuclear cells in this case are very atypical. They're pleomorphic. Um, they're hyperchromatic. Um, there's a lot of mitotic activity, including atypical mitoses. So this is just to illustrate that it's all, giant cells might help us to form a differential, but it's really the mononuclear cells we want to pay attention to at the end of the day. And in this case, we have atypical mononuclear cells. So when I see a giant cell rich lesion with um, malignant mononuclear cells, I think about metastatic carcinoma, um, giant cell rich osteosarcoma, and malignant giant cell tumor of bone, which as we mentioned in the beginning is pretty rare, but it does happen. Um, so giant cell rich osteosarcoma, um, in, this, in this lesion we have uh, these giant cells which are actually non-neoplastic scattered throughout um, uh, the background of malignant um, mesenchymal cells which are making uh, osteoid. So again, this is just a osteosarcoma that has a preponderance of um, giant cells. Um, the differential also includes malignant giant cell tumor of bone. Um, primary malignancy in giant cell tumor of bone is very uncommon. Um, malignant transformation of um, a precursor giant cell tumor of bone is more common um, than it occurring primarily. And in, in this example, or in this tumor, we basically have um, the malignant cells are just undifferentiated, look like an undifferentiated sarcoma or potentially osteosarcoma. Um, fortunately, most of these cases will show um, expression of G34W, so that can help support that this is um, a malignant giant cell tumor of bone. So back to our case, we had an 80-year-old with a thoracic spine lesion. Um, radi radiology actually showed multiple bone lesions and a large lung mass. So that would really um, favor it being uh, metastatic carcinoma with um, giant cells. We did a keratin stain, which was positive. So set that really supports this being a metastatic carcinoma. And uh, just to finish up the last two minutes or so, there's a few other um, bone tumors that can have giant cells that sometimes come up in the differential. And those include things like chondromyxoid fibroma, which is a lobulated cartilaginous neoplasm that can occur at almost any um, bone site, uh, typically in younger patients. Um, these behave in a, mostly in a benign fashion, but they can recur. And um, one of the most characteristic features for CMF is really its lobular architecture. So at low power, you see these distinct lobular, uh, lobulars, lobular, lobular areas, which are posse-cellular compared to the um, darker areas, which have um, giant cells in the background. So again, a lobular architecture in the posse-cellular zones, we have these stellate cells, and then they're bordered by these more cellular areas with um, giant cells. Recently, we've um, come up, we found that uh, the G, uh, GRM1 image chemistry helps to, um, uh, to make the diagnosis of chondromyxoid fibroma. Um, again, you don't always need this stain, but in some situations where the radiology might not fit perfectly, this can be a helpful ancillary study. And then the last entity I just want to mention is pseudomyogenic hemangioendothelioma. This is a vascular tumor, and patients are usually young males that present with multiple discontiguous nodules in, in both bone and soft tissue. Um, these have high recurrence rates, but rarely metastasize, and they're characterized by um, <clears throat> fusions with FOSB. 
Um, although these, these were first described in soft tissue, we now know they can occur in bone. And when they do, um, they frequently have um, giant cells. So this is an example of a pseudomyogenic hemangioendothelioma where we can see um, giant cells in the background uh, separated by um, or admixed with these interspersed mononuclear cells. These typically also have a lot of eosinophils, so that can be a clue that you're dealing with a vascular neoplasm. Again, giant cells in the background. We have these plump uh, spindled cells that almost look so, sort of rhabdoid. That's how this tumor got its, its name of pseudomyogenic. Um, these tumors are keratin positive and they stain for the FOSB marker. Um, these can be tricky because patients can present with multiple bone lesions and they're keratin positive. So it might lead you to think about metastatic disease. But again, these patients are often young. So if you have a keratin positive tumor that's multifocal in a young patient, think about pseudomyogenic rather than a metastatic process. So just to summarize, um, like we've mentioned, giant cells are really ubiquitous in bone lesions. So they can be seen in basically any bone lesion, but the pattern of their distribution can be helpful in uh, generating a differential. Um, at the end of the day, radiology, uh, radiologic correlation and correlation with clinical findings like lab values can really uh, be essential. And finally, we have new immunochemistry and molecular techniques that are not necessary, but can often be very helpful in definitive classification. Um, so with that, I'd just like to thank Dr. Illison. And if there's any questions, we'd be um, happy to, to take them. Thank you, Dr. Fritchie. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Fritchie and Dr. Illison. Um, at this point, I don't see any questions in the Q&A box, but we will have these materials posted on our landing page um, following the session. So um, if any of the attendees have any questions for Dr. Fritchie or Dr. Illison, please uh, send them to us and we'll make sure to um, run them by our experts. So thank you so much for um, speaking today. And uh, I think we've got Dr. Joe on the line. So we'll go ahead and get started with um, the next speaker. Okay, thanks. Share my screen. Perfect. So just as a reminder to our um, attendees, Dr. Joe will be speaking on cytology of soft tissue tumors, a pattern-based approach. And Dr. Joe, if you wouldn't mind just briefly introducing yourself before um, starting your talk, that would be great. My name is Dr. Joe. I am a cytopathologist and surgical pathologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, I practice both cytology, soft tissue pathology, as well as head and neck pathology. And I'm happy to speak about the intersection of two of my large interests, um, cytology, soft tissue tumors, using a pattern-based approach. Dr. So, Joe, sorry, before you get started, is there any way to increase the volume of your um, microphone? Um, Piece, uh, All right, you probably heard a lot of clanging, but that was me. That sounds Maybe better. A new microphone. Let's see. I think this will improve it immensely. Better? Yes, much better. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Apologies for that little hiccup. All right, so again, this is a cytology of soft tissue tumors. This is an area that is notoriously challenging for all practicing cytopathologists. And here we'll talk about using a pattern-based approach, which will help guide the formulation of differential diagnoses and ancillary testing. Uh, most soft tissue tumors fall into these six main cytomorphologic patterns, adipocytic, myxoid, spindle cell, round cell, epithelioid, and pleomorphic. 
And here we will outline common differential diagnoses in this morphology-based framework with emphasis on helpful clinical correlations to guide diagnosis. So as I mentioned previously, these are the six main patterns, and we'll walk through all six of these. So the first, when we think about adipocytic adipocytic patterns, uh, we think about lesions that have predominantly mature appearing fat cells or adipocytes, and those will most likely be lipomas and hibernomas, lipomas being white fat, mature fat, indistinguishable from benign fat that can be incidentally sampled, um, usually yield small fragments as shown here. And hibernomas are similar, um, they're benign, but they're comprised of brown fat, which are these uh, mature fat cells that have abundant cytoplasmic vacuolizations that are very fine, but still very small, uniform, ovoid, centrally placed nuclei. And oftentimes hibernomas will yield smears that have fragments with a delicate uh, vascular pattern and meshed in the in the fragments of mature fat. The main issue here is to distinguish benign tumors from atypical lipomatous tumor, also known as well-differentiated liposarcoma. These can also appear as lesions that have a mature adipocytic component. It's important to remember that most lipomas are small, less than five centimeters and superficial. Specifically recognizing ALT or WDL is important because these lesions require complete surgical resection as they are associated with a risk of recurrence and a potential to progress to dedifferentiated liposarcoma. So usually these lesions will yield large tissue fragments larger than those that you'll see in lipoma with clusters of adipocytes of varying sizes, although that size variation can be quite subtle. The diagnostic feature um, that requires some careful examination, particularly on a cytologic smear, is finding these atypical enlarged stromal cell nuclei that are usually between the fat cells. They also may be present, may be present in fibrous stroma if it's sampled. And I would strongly favor this diagnosis if the tumor size is greater than 10 centimeters, and especially if the tumor is located in the retroperitoneum, in the viscera, or in deep locations. And the diagnosis can be supported by proving MDM2 amplification, either by FISH or by immunochemistry. And I mentioned that these have the, have the ability to dedifferentiate and dedifferentiate liposarcoma, which is also characterized by MDM2 amplification, can show, a really, uh, can show a really broad morphologic range and really enters almost all the differential diagnoses of the patterns. So here you can see that this is a um, adipocytic pattern where it's making abundant lipoblasts. Here, um, this is a more myxoid pattern with an abundant myxoid stroma in the background. They can also appear somewhat spindled cell, somewhat epithelioid, and somewhat pleomorphic. And this is the most likely diagnosis in the retroperitoneum. So moving on to fat, fatty tumors that can have lipoblasts, there's two uh, specific entities that uh, you should think about. And the first is pleomorphic liposarcoma, and the second is myxoid liposarcoma. So pleomorphic liposarcoma typically arises in older adults in the deep-seated sites in the extremities. And these are characterized by having pleomorphic or spindle cell population, often entering the pleomorphic differential diagnosis, but they are also characterized by lipoblasts. And the presence of lipoblasts are the sole diagnostic criterion for this entity. These lipoblasts are often abundant, but sometimes they can be scarce due to sampling error or by irregular distribution through the tumor. You can see here that this is a classic lipoblast. It's evacuated with optically clear vacuoles containing lipid. And in a typical lipoblast, these vacuoles will kind of fill the cytoplasm and indent the nuclei of the lipoblast. So those are different than the hibernoma brown fat cells where those nuclei are really unbothered and unaffected by those cytoplasmic vacuoles. And again, the presence of these lipoblasts are the diagnostic criteria Tyrion for pleomorphic liposarcoma. It's important to remember that there are variants of dedifferentiated liposarcoma that can make lipoblasts. And so particularly pleomorphic liposarcoma is MDM2 negative. It's important to exclude particularly the retroperitoneum. So mixed liposarcoma, these um, 
arise in a somewhat younger population, usually adults in the fourth to fifth decades, but also arise in the deep-seated sites of the soft tissue of limbs. These will yield very large myxoid stromal fragments that have a characteristic vascular pattern of these branching delicate capillaries. They are also characterized by a uniform ovoid to round tumor cell population. They're very, very uniform, often uniformly distributed through the large myxoid stromal fragments, but we can see increased atypia and cellularity with grade. As I mentioned before, these um, are characterized by lipoblasts. These lipoblasts, um, you can see here from low power, are enmeshed also in the myxoid stromal fragments. They are usually uni or bivacuolated, but in contrast to pleomorphic liposarcoma, their presence is not required for the diagnosis. These are characterized by FUS DDIT3 fusions, uh, which can help support the diagnosis, but in many cases, the the cytologic features are diagnostic. As I mentioned, but, uh, just mentioned, lipoblasts are not necessary for the diagnosis. So here you can see this large myxoid stromal fragment with that really characteristic chicken wire or crow's feet thin walled vascular pattern investing the stromal fragment. And these uniform ovoid uh, to spindled cells embedded within there. Um, when the lipoblasts are present, it's a little bit easier to make the diagnosis. And I mentioned before, these lipoblasts are small. Here's a univacuolated one. Here are ones that have smaller vacuoles um, and that are uh, multivacuolated here. And again, that telltale vascular pattern. As they become higher grade, they become they can show increased cellularity, sometimes obscuring the myxoid stroma and the vascul vasculature. And that um, in this case, you can support the diagnosis either using DDIT3 fish, but there's a now immunochemical marker for DDIT3, which is highly sensitive and specific for myxoid liposarcoma. So this segues into looking um, into our myxoid lesions. And the first pattern to recognize within myxoid lesions are those that have an admix fat component. So we just talked about the features of myxoid liposarcoma. There's another uh, fatty tumor to consider in a, a prominent myxoid tumor, and that's spindle cell lipoma. You can already see in these two comparisons that spindle cell lipoma um, has some similarities, large myxoid stromal fragments in which there's a fatty component embedded within them, as well as a uniform ovoid to spindle cell population. However, there isn't a prominent vascular pattern here. These also have a very particular clinical pathologic presentation where these will typically present in adult males as subcutaneous masses in the posterior neck, back, or shoulder. And most cases present um, in that setting. As uh, we, again, large uh, myxoid stromal fragments, which can also be very variably collagenous. And the thing to notice is that the, we'll often see ropey collagen fibers um, that kind of are embedded within and fall off of those large myxoid stromal fragments. These tumor cells have a characteristic bland, short, stubby spindle cell population. Um, and the fat is typically uh, mature fat. So you often won't uh, will see mature fat and not lipoblasts in this entity. These lack prominent vasculature as mentioned before and is a helpful feature to distinguish from myxoid liposarcoma in addition to the very different clinical presentation. And these lack DDIT3 fusions and are characterized by 13Q deletions. So another myxoid pattern to consider are lesions that are bland and hypercellular. This class of lesions is very difficult uh, because there's significant overlap between benign entities, which comprise the majority of the differential diagnosis, but as well as low-grade sarcomas, typically low-grade myxofibrosarcoma and low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma. Immunohistochemistry really has limited value here since there aren't characteristic immunohistochemical profiles for a lot of the entities, apart from low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma, which is characterized by MUC4 expression. If immunohistochemistry is not available, it's appropriate to give a descriptive diagnosis and favoring benign or malignants. 
So just comparing uh, to show how difficult this differential can be, here's an example of an intramuscular myxoma that's particularly cellular. You can see here this myxoid stroma is abundant, somewhat granular and filmy, just kind of spread um, spread uh, in the background. And the spindle cell population is really, really uniform. On the right side, you can see a low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma, which again, abundant uh, myxoid stroma, in this case, a little less granular and filmy. Um, and you can see here, there are spindle and ovoid cells embedded within here. And it's really not much more cellular than this benign tumor. And there's not a lot of appreciable atypia either. It really takes a lot of uh, searching to convince yourself of the mild cytologic atypia. These typically present uh, low grade fibromyxoid sarcoma typically arises in young adults as deep seated tumors in the lower limbs. And as a characteristic clinical course, where these patients will often enjoy a long lifespan and develop recurrences and metastases decades after primary diagnosis. These cytologic features are really deceptively bland, and most are difficult to recognize as sarcomas. Again, it really is this very subtle, slightly ovoid, slightly atypical, slightly hyperchromatic tumor cell population that should tip you off into a staining for MUC4. Uh, MUC4 is highly sensitive and specific and is negative in all the benign mimics. Um, if the laboratory has FUS fish available, that can also support the diagnosis. But in some cases, it may not be possible and you have to um, be descriptive, but also raise the possibility of malignancy, particularly if the patient fits uh, this presentation. And here's a picture of MUC4 showing that uh, characteristic cytoplasmic diagnostic staining. So there's um, also myxoid tumors that will appear more cellular and uniform. Most of these are translocation-associated neoplasms, and most of these arise in the limbs of adults. So uh, here, in this case, uh, the differential can be quite challenging without ancillary testing, but a descriptive cytologic diagnosis would be appropriate in many cases. So this is just a table outlining the differential diagnosis of myxoid liposarcoma, sclerosing epithelioid fibrosarcoma, extraskeletal myxoid chondrosarcoma, ossifying fibromyxoid tumor, and myopathelial neoplasms of soft tissue. And these are um, all rare entities, but relatively uh, common in this differential diagnosis. Here you can see the characteristic fusions and something that is somewhat problematic is that EWSR1 is a fusion associated with several of the entities in this table. Uh, so some of the uh, immunophenotypes are going to be helpful in separating these out, such as MUC4 and sclerosing epithelial fibrosarcoma, and keratin co-expression with S100 and GFAP and myopathelial neoplasms of soft tissue. So comparing these uh, three of these side by side, you can see that mixed with liposarcoma, again, diagnostic uh, markers being DDIT3 immunochemistry or FUS fish. These will have the very typical uh, crow's feet, thin-walled uh, branching vessels, um, very uniform cell population, which is characteristic of all entities in this differential. Extraskeletal mixed chondrosarcoma typically has a very... Uh, vibrant chondromyxoid stroma that's very fibrillary in the background. The tumor cells will often show these kind of bipolar reticular, uh, bipolar cytoplasmic processes that may impart a reticular appearance. And the myopathial neoplasms of soft tissue, and here I've shown a malignant variant, they often show a variable uh, cytomorphology with more epithelioid and spindled and ovoid cells within a myxoid stroma. The myxoid pattern uh, where there's there are characteristically pleomorphic tumor cells um, obviously overlaps with the pleomorphic pattern. Here uh, are three entities that can often show a prominent myxoid stroma. So myxofibrosarcoma being the prototype. D-differentiated liposarcoma, as I mentioned earlier, can enter any differential diagnosis. Um, and here's one that has prominent myxoid stroma with pleomorphic cells. And pleomorphic liposarcoma, in some cases, um, you can get um, represented, representative uh, 
areas biopsied where there's prominent myxoid stroma that's indistinguishable from myxofibrosarcoma and the um, hard to diagnose because the characteristic pleomorphic lipoblasts are not present. So myxofibrosarcoma, it's important to remember, is the most common sarcoma in elderly patients. Typically presents um, in the limbs, um, and they can be either dermal or subcutaneous in depth or deep. Uh, and these have characteristic curvilinear vessels, these long arcuate vessels um, and that are often associated with large fragments of myxoid stroma. The atypia can vary, can be very mild in low-grade tumors, but can be more pronounced as the tumors get high-grade. As they become high-grade, they become more cellular. And um, on the high-grade end of the spectrum, those will more readily enter the pleomorphic differential diagnosis. But the characteristic features are those long arcuate vessels and those large myxoid stromas and careful examination to make sure that there are no pleomorphic lipoblasts. Here again, showing two other examples where you can see those characteristic long curvilinear vessels. These are different than myxoid liposarcomas in that there's pronounced pleomorphism in the tumor cells. The tumor, the vasculature is not delicate and branching, and there's usually not a prominent vascu uh, lipoblastic component. So moving on to spindle cell patterns, uh, this... Uh, uh, it's important to just kind of keep these general principles in mind, um, whether or not you have ancillary testing available in your laboratory. So most spindle cell lesions will yield fascicular and or cohesive fragments. And it's important to consider the cellularity and the background when trying to separate out grades. So benign versus malignant is the most important distinction in this pattern. So tumors that have clean backgrounds tend to be benign or show indolent behavior. And sarcomas will often show highly cellular fragments with busy backgrounds, often with singly dispersed cells and nuclei, severe nuclear atypia and necrosis in atypical mitotic forms and high mitotic activity, but it's important to remember that some benign and intermediate tumors can overlap and enter the differential diagnosis with sarcomas. So a nice example of a benign spindle cell neoplasm is schwannomas. These are anatomically ubiquitous, can arise in almost any site. And these will often yield uh, large fragments of spindle cells that are different, often described as puzzle piece-like. You note here a very clean background, not a lot of single cells in the background. And within these kind of jigsaw puzzle piece-like fragments, you can see these spindle cells embedded within the stroma. These will often have um, spindled or fish hook uh, morphologies, kind of the bent uh, nuclei. And Schwannian cells will often have pointed edges, ends to the nuclei. So those are some helpful features when you see this jigsaw puzzle-like pattern and clean background. Of course, the differential diagnosis can vary based on site. And in the gastrointestinal tract, it's important to remember that schwannomas can be hard to distinguish from benign leiomyomas, as well as gastrointestinal stromal tumors. And this is one, um, th in this differential, it's almost impossible to distinguish between these three on cytomorphologic features alone. So if your lab has uh, these immunized chemical stains available, this will help you distinguish between these three. So S100 and SOX10 um, are, are markers for of Schwannian differentiation. SMA and Desmond will identify most cases of leiomyomas, being that these are smooth muscle markers, and KIT and DOG1 will stain most cases of gastrointestinal stromal tumor. So desmoid fibromatosis is an indolent tumor that enters the differential diagnosis of both benign and malignant spindle cell neoplasms. There's imp important clinical correlations to remember. So these typically arise in younger patients with more commonly arising in women. These can present as extra abdominal tumors, tumors arising in the anterior abdominal wall, as well as intra-abdominal tumors. And there are some useful clinical associations to consider. So a family history, um, so familial adenomatous polyposis syndrome. Um, free, uh, those patients frequently uh, present with desmoid tumors. And then patients who have been pregnant or had a prior C-section. And desmoid tumors can also arise in areas of scar um, as well as radiation treatment. 
These lesions will yield long fascicles uh, of spindle cells associated with collagenous stroma. And because these are very infiltrative, they'll often um, yield, uh, they'll often bring along fragments of degenerated skeletal muscle in an aspirate smear or biopsy. These are characterized by CTNNB1 mutations or in the setting of FAP, APC mutations, which lead to beta catenin nuclear overexpression in about 70 to 80% of cases. As I mentioned, um, these are very infiltrative and they can frequently recur, but they will not metastasize. When the smears of spindle cell lesions get busier, think higher grade. So most intermediate risk neoplasms and sarcomas will yield highly cellular smears. Here you can see these, um, you can see in this example of synovial sarcoma, densely cellular fragments, and that's with single cells and nuclei in the background between the fragments. Again, in sarcomas, you'll often see um, high mitotic activity and necrosis, and sarcomas that are translocation-associated are often very uniform. And as I mentioned before, D-differentiated liposarcoma can enter every differential, and particularly in the retroperitoneum, consider MDM2 testing of any spindle cell sarcoma. So here are some benign tumors that can enter the differential diagnosis. Cellular schwannomas can yield very um, long fascicular fragments, um, but again, very clean background, um, indicating that it's likely malignant. And then on, um, you can see in these nuclei on the edge that these kind of have very uniform spindled and buckled nuclei with these pointy edges. And of course, it's really positive for S100 and SOX10. You might also consider nodular fasciitis. These will have a typical presentation um, where they uh, grow quickly over the course of several months, and they actually will regress, regress over the course of several months spontaneously. So these are considered to be a, quote, transient neoplasm, as these are characterized by USP6 MYH9 fusions. And you'll see here that these will yield um, busy, loosely cohesive, distinctly dispersed aspirate smears of spindled myofibroblastic cells. And in some cases, SMA staining will help guide the diagnosis in the setting of the typical presentation. But occasionally you may need to uh, seek molecular testing to, uh, to identify USP6 fusions. So going through some diagnoses um, or um, soft tissue spindle tumors that will enter this uh, sarcoma or higher grade uh, pattern. So solitary fibrous tumor, which is actually an intermediate biologic risk, rarely metastasizing. These will often yield busy fragments of kind of anastomosing spindle cell fragments, but will also have spindle cells that kind of spill off the fragments and fill the background. These are conventionally known to be positive for CD34. And we also know that these will overexpress STAT6. And here you can see the nice nuclear staining and that's secondary to NAB2 STAT6 fusion. Synovial sarcoma, um, as I showed in that one example, will typically have kind of a very uh, busy smear pattern where you'll see large fragments with kind of spindle cells that uh, unif um, that are very uniform that spill off of the fragments and kind of fill the spaces between the larger shaggy fragments. Uh, the cytomorphology of these, as I mentioned before, are very uniform, and that gives uh, that is a telltale sign that this is a translocation associated sarcoma. And these uh, synovial sarcoma particularly has SS18, SSX fusions, um, and that's associated with, um, and that can be identified with immunose chemistry against a fusion protein, as well as using SS18 fish. Here you can see here, uh, this is just an example of a biphasic synovial sarcoma. So those will still have the same spindle cell population uh, with the shaggy fragments and the nuclei um, investing the spaces between the fragments. But you can see here these little areas where there's nuclear palisading and acinar formation. Um, um, and that's the epithelial differentiation in a biphasic synovial sarcoma.
So malignant peripheral nursing tumor will often mimic cases of synovial sarcoma, um, but these are not translocation associated. Here you'll see kind of large fragments of spindle cells where you can see from even this low, relatively low power, these eight, the atypia of those spindle cells is quite pronounced. Here you can see here, there's some hint that this may be neural with the kind of more buckled uh, nuclear forms and the pointy, pointy edges. The diagnosis of malignant peripheral nourishing tumor can be somewhat challenging, uh, both on morphology and by immunochemistry. Clinical associations are actually very helpful for this diagnosis, so they can be associated with a peripheral nerve. They can arise in a pre pre-existing neurofibroma, and they can arise in the setting of neurofibromatosis type 1. But with others associations, the diagnosis can be very hard, particularly because conventional Schwannian markers are frequently negative. So S100, GFAP, and SOX10 are often negative in this tumor. We now know that these will have inactivating mutations in the genes EED or SUZ12 in 70 to 90% of cases. And these are genes that encode subunits of the polycomb repressor complex 2, which is an epigenetic regulator. And this results in the loss of the trimethylation mark of lysine 27 of histone H3. And this loss of trimethylation can be detected by immunohistochemistry as shown here. We can see the tumor cells in the cell block are completely negative, and these are all inflammatory cells that have retained expression. So that can be quite a useful marker, um, particularly when clinical associations are not present. But it's important to remember that these are most frequently lost in high-grade and radiation-associated MPNSTs and are frequently retained in low-grade MPNSTs. So the last uh, spindle cell lesion to think about is Lyomire sarcoma of soft tissue. These often arise in association with a large vessel, and so that's an helpful uh, clinical correlation to remember. These yield very busy fascicular fragments with um, atypical malignant appearing spindle cells that are often overlapping uh, within uh, those fragments. And the fact that these are often very uh, pleomorphic and, atyp and have pronounced atypia really, um, while these may overlap with malignant pearl nursery tumors, um, you can see here that this is likely not a synovial sarcoma. Immunohistochemistry can be helpful, um, and these will be positive for the smooth muscle, muscle markers SMA, Desmond, and Caldesmond. Moving on to the round cell pattern, most of these are translocation-associated sarcomas, and most of these represent very aggressive sarcomas. It's important to remember that the differential diagnosis also includes lymphomas, melanomas, and neuroendocrine tumors. And that differential will be somewhat uh, swayed depending on whether or not this is a child versus an adult. Ancillary testing is a necessary for diagnosis in most practice settings. And so what I think is at least helpful for separating out um, a sarcoma from these mimics is doing an initial panel that includes CD99 for Ewing sarcoma, Desmond for alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, keratin for neuroendocrine tumors and other specific round cell tumors, S100 for melanoma, and TDT or LCA for um, lymphomas. So Ewing sarcomas, um, these are the prototypical round cell sarcoma comprised of a very uniform population of round cells, often with a tigroid background. This kind of somewhat striped um, background is secondary to glycogen from the cytoplasm of these tumor cells breaking apart. They're very, very uniform. Again, translocation associated. In cytomorphology, you will often not see pronounced atypia or necrosis for these tumors. Um, however, um, one feature that can be very helpful to see is this characteristic light and dark cell populations that are just often described in the textbooks. And what this refers to is the lighter cells having larger nuclei that are the viable cells and the secondary darker, more pycnotic round cells, which are considered to be the dying or, um, the dying or less viable cell population. These will show a typical um, immunochemical pattern of diffuse membranous CD99 staining. And NKX22 is a nice nuclear marker that's 
sensitive and specific for Ewing sarcoma. And these have EWSR1 fly fusions and usually EWSR1 fish will identify most cases. Alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma is another round cell sarcoma that's relatively common in this differential. Uh, these are comprised of large round and polygonal cells, uh, much more pleomorphic and atypical than most cases of Ewing sarcoma. And it's important uh, to remember that when you see these wreath-like nuclear, uh, wreath-like giant cells with the nuclei arranged kind of in an almost floret-like pattern, that's very common in alveolar rhabdomyosarcomas and can be helpful for the your differential diagnosis. These are relatively common in the head and neck. These can be recognized by immunohistochemistry using desmin and myogenin staining. And the myogenin um, transcription factor typically shows a diffuse nuclear pattern in the alveolar variant of rhabdomyosarcoma. In some cases, you may have to do uh, molecular testing, and FOXO1 uh, fish is at least the more popular assay to use uh, for alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. I'll just point out, since these can arise in the head and neck and in adults, that up to a third of these will stain for keratins and neuroendocrine markers, which can be a pitfall for neuroendocrine carcinomas in these older patients in these sites. Desmoplastic small round cell tumor is another small uh, round cell sarcoma that is uh, harbors EWSR1 fusions. These have a typical presentation of arising in the abdominal cavity of young men. 75 to 80% of affected patients are males and the remainder are females. These are small round cell tumors, but yield on smears more cohesive groups of these round cells. And you can see um, here um, these cohesive groups, as well as sometimes you'll see hints of the desmoplastic stroma that's sampled. Um, what's common in these is you'll see kind of nuclear palisading, acinar or rosette formation, even in these fragments here. And that is um, a helpful feature to recognizing desmoplastic small round cell tumors. These have um, a peculiar, peculiar immunophenotype where they'll be positive for desmin, keratin, and if you have the polyclonal um, antibody to WT1, they'll show nuclear staining for that. And that's important to use to uh, have in conjunction with the EWSR1 fish positive result because obviously EWSR1 fish uh, break apart um, is not sensitive and specific for Ewing sarcoma alone. It's, it'll be positive in cases of DSRCT as well. And I'll just lastly point out that some variants can show round cell morphology. So high-grade myxoid liposarcoma can show a predominance of and hypercellularity of rounded cells that can kind of obscure the myxoid stroma and the vessels. Again, these can be recognized by FUS fish or DDIT3 immunochemistry. In some cases, a poorly differentiated synovial sarcoma will perfectly mimic a round cell sarcoma, and these can be recognized by SS18 fish or SS18 SSX uh, immunochemistry. So uh, let's talk about the epithelioid pattern next. These are a diverse group of soft tissue tumors. Most of these are malignants. Uh, the epithelioid uh, uh, is, describes uh, these tumor cells that have, are round or polygonal, that have moderate to ample amounts of cytoplasm, and they often have a rounded nucleus, and these tumor cells will usually be singly dispersed or in clusters. And these, uh, the diagnosis of these really require ancillary studies and inclusive panels, particularly because this cytomorphology can be difficult to tell apart from carcinomas and melanomas. And I'll just briefly mention two common benign epithelial tumors that can enter the differential diagnosis. So tenosynovial giant cell tumor, which often arises in or around the limbs. These typically um, have an admixture of histiocytoid cells, um, foamy histiocytes, and osteoclast-like giant cells. So even though we're seeing this epithelioid pattern, that constellation of features and the lack of um, overt malignant features such as florid pleomorphism, necrosis, um, those um, will be diagnostic for tenosynovial giant cell tumors. And these have CSF1 rearrangements. 
And granular cell tumors can also enter this differential. We'll usually use uh, C syncytial clusters with abundant granular cytoplasm that's often fragile and falls apart. But nonetheless, you can see this kind of epithelial population. Um, and those will be positive for S100 and neuron specific enolase. So epithelial sarcoma, um, these are characterized by inactivation of SMARC B1, of the SMARC B1 gene. And these will typically arise in the extremities of younger patients, particularly for the morphologic distal type, or in the more prox or in the limb girdles of older patients in the so-called proximal type variant. And you can see here that um, these epithelioid cells are loosely cohesive and singly dispersed. We see round nuclei that are often eccentrically placed, usually with a prominent nucleolus. Binucleated forms are very common in any epithelioid pattern, and these will usually have a dense cytoplasm. These will be positive for pan-keratin CD34 and due to secondary to smark b one inactivation, show loss of smark b one protein expression. It's important to remember to have a good positive control in that um, in when you're examining that stain. Uh, epithelial hemangioendothelioma can look very similar, indistinguishable for many cases of epithelial sarcomas and other epithelioid patterns. These are anatomically ubiquitous, although half are thought to originate from a vessel. Tumors are often multicentric, showing local regional metastases. Um, and what's helpful if present are intracytoplasmic vacuoles, as well as myxoid or, or fibrostroma that's uh, sampled. These have CAMTA1 WWTR1 fusions. So here you can see here um, the mixoid, chondromyxoid stroma that can be sampled, but this typical epithelioid population. And when you see the intracytoplasmic vacuole, um, that is usually uh, informative of vascular differentiation. But of course, these uh, can be really impossible to tell apart from some carcinoma. So that's really why at least a rudimentary uh, immunochemical panel with keratins is important. So these will be positive for ERG, which is a nice vascular marker, but also positive for CD31 and CD34, other vascular markers. And th because these have CAMTA1 fusions, these will be show nuclear staining for CAMTA1 immunochemistry. So angiosarcoma um, can be hard to tell apart from epithelial and hemangioendothelioma, but these are much more aggressive. These are negative for CAMTA1, uh, so that immunochemistry can be helpful. And here you can see that we'll see dispersed atypical epithelioid cells, but these can show more vari variable tumor cell shapes. They can show spindled, pleomorphic uh, cells as well, and multinucleation is very common. Often a bloody background is described, and because these are vascular tumors, you can see cytoplasmic vacuoles in some cases, um, as well as hemosiderin. Here, I just wanted to show a more drawn out uh, spindle cell morphology admix with the uh, epithelioid cells. And you can see here much more pleomorphism. And as I mentioned before, these will be multinucleated. Here you can see pronounced multinucleation. Clear cell sarcoma of soft tissue is another tumor that can show this epithelioid pattern. These typically arise in young adults, commonly in the distal extremities within the tendons. These um, will show melanocytic differentiation and are positive for S100, SOX10, MART1, and HMB45. And it's important to uh, distinguish from malignant melanoma in many cases. Again, an epithelioid pattern of loosely uh, uh, dispersed epithelioid cells, oftentimes binucleated. Uh, this, particularly in clear cell sarcoma, will often see paley eosinophilic or cleared vacuolated cytoplasm. Uh, if helpful, wreath like uh, giant cells um, um, being present can uh, help support the diagnosis, but they're often not apparent in smears and not pictured in this representative. Uh, photograph. These also have EWSR1 fusions in these cases, usually to the ATF1 fusion partner.
And the last pattern, pattern to round out is a pleomorphic pattern. These are usually aggressive sarcomas, but of course it's important to remember aggressive carcinomas as well. These typically arise in adults and many have indistinct immunophenotypes and complex genetics. So um, ancillary testing actually can be quite limited in utility in this, in this morphologic pattern. These are really can be difficult to distinguish from one another on morphologic grounds. And I'll just point out that uh, D-differential liposarcoma has a lower metastatic rate compared to the other tumor types. Um, pleomorphic liomyosarcoma and pleomorphic rhabdomyosarcoma. So the sarcoma types that have myogenic differentiation are the most aggressive with the highest metastatic rates. And then pleomorphic liposarcoma, undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, mixofibrosarcoma, extraskeletal osteosarcoma kind of hover in between. So the first step when looking at a pleomorphic pattern is to look for conventional features of mixofibrosarcoma or pleomorphic liposarcoma. So as I mentioned before, mixofibrosarcomas will have that characteristic curvilinear vessels as well as mixoid stroma. And pleomorphic liposarcoma can also have mixoid stroma, but will have and can also have the uh, curvilinear vessels, but will have the characteristic pleomorphic lipoblasts. So once you've excluded those two, then it's important uh, you, you can use immunochemistry to identify other entities in the differential. So D differential liposarcoma, pleomorphic liomysarcoma pleomorphic rhabdomyosarcoma, as well as extraskeletal osteosarcoma. And you'll also want to exclude carcinoma, melanoma, and in some cases, lymphoma, such as anaplastic large cell lymphoma. So D-differentiated liposarcoma, we know have MDM2, CDK4, MDM2 amplification. So you can identify that by FISH or by MDM2, CDK4 immunochemistry. And for pleomorphic liomyosarcoma, you may not see the characteristic vesicular spindle cell growth. These will be positive for SMA, Desmond, and Caldesmon. Pleomorphic rhabdomyosarcomas will be also be positive for Desmond, as well as the skeletal muscle-specific markers, myogenin and myoD1. And for extraskeletal osteosarcoma, you'll look for the presence of osteoid, this kind of refractile, dense, um, wiry extracellular matrix often embedded within uh, and between um, the, the malignant tumor cells. Um, and so those will be positive and they'll be positive for SATB2 to support osteoblastic differentiation. And then after you've excluded all entities, that's only when you can make the diagnosis of unclassified pleomorphic liposarcoma. And I actually rarely make that diagnosis on cytology because of the fact that we have to exclude so many entities and sampling error is always going to be um, part of the picture when looking at a cytology case. So this is a diagnosis of exclusion and you may not be able to distinguish from mixofibrosarcoma or pleomorphic liposarcoma on FNA, particularly because we may not have sampled the characteristic curvilinear vessels or lipoblasts. So I always recommend a descriptive diagnosis of high-grade pleomorphic sarcoma in this scenario. So um, looks like I'm ending with some time to spare. So just some take-home points is that this pattern-based approach of adipocytic, mixoid, spindled, epithelioid, round cell, and pleomorphic patterns is practical for the diagnostic workup of soft tissue tumors in any practice setting. Um, if available, ancillary testing, both immunochemistry and molecular testing can greatly enhance our, our ability to make definitive diagnoses. But it's just important to remember that the goal of FNA for soft tissue tumors is really to triage lesions. So it's not necessary to make a definitive diagnosis. And that's really where this pattern-based approach can be helpful to at least kind of narrow down um, your differential and to say with some certainty whether or not you think it's benign or malignant. And that really distinguishing between that biologic risks will is the most important for guiding clinical management, regardless of having all these uh, very specific, uh, specific tools. So with that, I'll end and happy to take any questions. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Dr. Joe. So we do have one question, which is what are reasonable expectations for ancillary testing in soft tissue FNA? Dr. Joe, are you able to hear us? I think we might have lost your audio. Okay, we'll just give it one more minute. In the meantime, I'm going to put our uh, grant. Right. Oh, Dr. Joe? Oh, sorry, I think I'm not hearing. Oh, maybe. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much, Dr. Joe. Um, we do have, if you're still there, we do have uh, one question. Oh, okay. I think we lost Dr. Joe. Well, on behalf of ASCP, I just want to thank you all for attending today's webinar. Um, our next webinar will be on Tuesday, May 16th, covering use of mole molecular testing and NGS as diagnosis, adjuncts, and response to therapy. Please use our landing page in the chat um, for registering for this uh, next meeting and also for accessing today's recording. We want to send a special thank you to our collaborators at Project Pink Blue and look forward to seeing you all on uh, Tuesday. Thanks so much and have a great evening.